All right. Let's hear it again for those kids. My heart is full this morning as I was a proud father, but also I just love our kids here at the Grace Place. Amen. Excited to be here this morning. Uh, we've been gone for a couple weeks, so it's great to be back. And I'm excited to be back home here at the Grace Place. Amen. Have you ever been to the circus? Yeah. My kids went to the county fair this week, and they enjoyed the circus. And this reminded me of a story, albeit a, a tragic one. So here's the warning. It's, it's sad. It was 27 years ago yesterday, actually, on August 20th, 1994. Tyke, a 20-year-old female elephant, was, uh, had just entered the circus ring and was kicking around what looked to the audience like a dummy. We thought it was part of the show, one witness told the Honolulu Press. But they soon realized that the supposed dummy was a severely injured groomer. And panic ensued. The audience fled in a frenzy. Tyke went on to fatally crush her trainer, who was trying to intervene, before fleeing the arena herself. For about 30 minutes, Tyke was finally walking free. But unfortunately, it wasn't in her natural habitat like it was supposed to be. It was rather in the streets of Honolulu. This was her first moment of freedom since she had been abducted by poachers as a baby and been working in the circus ever since. The circus promoter was chasing her and Tyke soon was running past neighborhood businesses and finally she began a foot chase with the Honolulu police who eventually shot her 87 times before she succumbed to nerve damage and brain hemorrhages. People watched from their cars, apartments, sidewalks, as this became known as the most horrific circus death ever. As a result, no circus elephants have performed in Honolulu since Tyke, and the Tyke incident challenged many people around the world to think about their relationship with circus animals, and many circuses stopped using exotic animals altogether. My sermon today is titled Walking Free. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father God, you know me, and my goal today is to let these people know you. So may I decrease, and may you increase. Send your Holy Spirit to be with us. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. My sermon today features a story. It's a story that begins with shepherds watching their flock, and a baby being born in a stable. And it ends with a God so full of love that he would stop at nothing, that he would leave everything in order to find us. There's a famous praise song called Reckless Love, and lyrics of the song go, there's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. These lines were composed by Corey Asbury, and the song became so popular that it has nearly 63 million views on YouTube, and several artists have covered it. Sometimes people get confused, though. They read the title of the song, and they don't understand. But the moment you hear it, and you know the story behind it, you realize how intimate the love of God is. The word reckless does not refer to God himself. The God we are serving is not reckless. However, it refers to the way God loves us. Mm -hmm. If you try to consider what he did on the cross, he is utterly not concerned with the consequences of his actions in regards to his safety, his comfort, and his well-being. He's so in love with you and me that he came to earth to show how much he is willing to sacrifice just to have you back in his arms. Mm -hmm. His love isn't selfish, and he is never self-serving. He would offer his life to give us the freedom that we don't deserve. His love leaves the 99 just to find the one who went astray. Which means he would have even laid down his life on the cross, even if it was only just for one. Corey himself experienced the same kind of love. As he said in a recent interview, his love saw me, a broken down kid with regret as deep as the ocean. And he found me, and he put me on his shoulders, and he carried me on, because he is just that good. He is just that kind. 
He is a father that never gives up. Not only could I relate to the song and the meaning behind it, but I too have lived a life full of regret and mistakes. I've sinned so bad that I have felt unworthy and ashamed. My sin distanced me so far from God, it felt like it was impossible to make up for it. In fact, I set out, set out on a search to find satisfaction, purpose, and peace. But the harder I searched, the further from purpose and peace I got. Even though I felt so lost, God continued to search for me, the one missing from his flock, wandering about life without purpose, without passion, without love. And once he found me, he brought me back home, and he let me walk free. Mm. By examining Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 17, you will see how God's reckless love for you will bring you home so you can walk free. Amen. Luke 15 presents three parables about recovering what is lost, and all three appear to be prompted by the complaints of the scribes or teachers of the law and the Pharisees over Jesus' fellowship with tax collectors and sinners. And the first parable, the one we'll focus on today, is concerning a stray, a stray sheep. So let's, look, let's open up the word as we read Luke 15, 1 through 7. And I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Luke 15, starting with verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Amen. Amen. Now keep your Bibles open here as we're going to examine each verse a little more closely. First off, in response to the religious leader's complaint, Jesus tells parables to explain his purpose in welcoming sinners and sharing table fellowship with them. He teaches that each repentant sinner prompts a heavenly celebration. Verse 1, you notice the words, we're all drawing near. The word all. It's an emphatic use of the word all. Literally means all were nearing. It indicates that this was a habitual experience in Jesus' ministry. In verse 2, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law say, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. The tax collectors were not highly regarded, for they both helped the hated Romans in their administration of conquered territory and enriched themselves in the process at the expense of their fellow countrymen. They were ostracized by many, and regarded as outcasts by the religious. The sinners were the immoral, or those who followed occupations that the religious regarded as incompatible with the law. The Pharisees and the, and the scribes kept grumbling because Jesus received such people. There was this old rule that one must not associate with an ungodly person. And let me point out to you that this was taken so seriously that the rabbis would not associate with such a person even to teach them the law. This is indicated in Acts chapter 10 verse 28. Furthermore, eating, eating with these people was regarded as worse than mere association. It implied a welcome, a recognition, and a loyalty. In Old Testament times, eating together was also an act of a covenant. Therefore, they thought this man was contemptuous. But Jesus did not let the Pharisees interfere with his ministry. He had come to help sinners, which he could scarcely do if he did not meet with them and spend time with them. Also, it's important to note here, 
But the modern chapter division makes us miss an important point. In the previous chapter, Jesus had just made an uncompromising demand for wholeheartedness as he showed what following him meant. He finished his appeal for discipleship with he who has ears, let him hear. Luke's very next words tell us that these sinners came near to hear him. Whatever the case with the Pharisees and those who called themselves religious, these sinners had answered the call. They knew what discipleship meant. And they were called on to hear, and they heard. God actively seeks out sinners and brings them home. The rabbis agreed that God would welcome a penitent sinner. But it was a new idea that God is a seeking God. A God who takes the initiative. The Old Testament warnings not to associate with sinful people were no doubt applied to Jesus' association with tax collectors and sinners. Yet Jesus associated with such people to offer them salvation Amen. through repentance and faith, not to participate in their sin. In verses 3 and 4, you see the word open country, which literally means a desert. And Matthew has this account as well. In Matthew 18, 12, he writes, On the hills. But since most shepherding was done on desert mountains, east of Bethlehem, either term could be used to describe this area. And the word for lost in Greek is apolyumi, which is also translated as perish. For the reality to what this word refers, the lost sheep would perish if it wasn't for the shepherd taking the initiative and searching it out. Jesus appeals to custom in this parable. Should one sheep stray, any shepherd would lead the 99 who were safe and look for the missing one. The 99 are in no danger. They are found. But the safe possession of 99 is no substitute for the loss of one. So the shepherd keeps looking, as it says, until he finds it. Keeps looking until he finds it. He makes more than a token search. He wants his sheep, so he looks until he finds it. Amen. The metaphor of a shepherd is used for God in Psalm 23 and Ezekiel 34, verses 11 through 16. I memorized Psalm 23 when I was in kindergarten, and it has stuck with me ever since. I'm sure many of you know it as well. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Lord is my shepherd. Depth and strength underlie the simplicity of this psalm. It's peace, it's not escape. It's contentment, it's not complacency. There's a readiness to face deep darkness and imminent attack. And the climax reveals a love which homes in on no material goal but to the Lord himself. The Lord, as often in the psalms, occupies here the first and emphatic place. And the my reveals a pledged relationship. David uses the most comprehensive and intimate metaphor yet encountered in the Psalms, preferring usually to use the, most, the more distant sounding king or deliverer, or the impersonal sounding rock or shield, whereas the shepherd lives with his flock and is everything to it. The guide, the physician, the protector, God would not have taken on a flock, a family, if he had not intended that he and we should be together with one another. Yeah. Mercy is a covenantal word rendered here as steadfast love elsewhere. Together with goodness, it suggests the steady kindness and support that one can count on with family or between best friends. And it ends with the journey home to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
because this metaphor was used in the Old Testament, then at the time that Jesus was telling this parable, the analogy of a sheep and a shepherd would have been easily comprehended. But today, in 2021, we are far removed from the idea of a shepherd and a flock of sheep. I don't know about you, but the only sheep I've been counting are when I'm lying in bed trying to fall asleep. So try to picture this. A shepherd is counting a sheep at night and finds one missing. Sheep aren't the most intelligent animals. They spend most of their time eating. While grazing in the fields, they easily become distracted. And soon, they spot some more grass and wander off to eat it. Sheep would wander off into the rocks and get into places that they just couldn't get out of. The grass in these mountains was very sweet, and the sheep liked it. And they would jump down 10 or 12 feet, but then they couldn't jump back up. And the shepherd hears them bleeding in distress. They may be there for days even, until they've eaten all the grass there. And the shepherd will wait until they are so faint that they cannot stand. And then will put a rope around him, and he will go over and pull that sheep out, out of the jaws of death. But why don't they go down there when the sheep first gets there, you might ask? Well, they are so very foolish that they would dash right back over again. Or they would be startled into falling off the steep cliff. So oftentimes the shepherd would wait until they ate all the grass that distracted them in the first place. And that is the way that it is with sinners too. They won't go back to God until they have lost everything. How easy is it, is it for us to get distracted and enticed into sinful ways? If you are a wanderer, I tell you, that the good shepherd will bring you back yes. the moment you have given up trying to save yourself yes. Wow. Yes. and are willing to let him save you his own way. Yes. God has a new beginning in store for you. Yes. And the way you prepare for it is by getting rid of the old. Wow. <laughs> Let's pick it back up where we left off. Verse 4. Notice the words, until he finds it. When this detail is applied to Jesus' teaching about sinners, it conveys the divine initiative to recover those who are lost. It also reveals the persistence of the shepherd, which leaves the open the possibility of not finding the sheep as well. Some of the lost sinners, unfortunately, are never found. That possibility is a reality, and it's a result of free will. In verse 5, notice the words, He places it on his shoulders. The shepherd carries the sheep to safety. The aspect of this parable's picture expresses the shepherd's loving care. And he has been a favorite, th this moment has been a favorite artistic theme throughout the centuries. Frequently you'll see the sheep that became lost and weak and pictured on the shepherd's shoulders across churches all across the world. And in verse 6, it says, the shepherd calls his friends and neighbors. This detail is lacking in Matthew's account, in chapter 18, verse 13 in Matthew. Another difference between Matthew and Luke is the, the word lost sheep. In Matthew 18, the sheep are not lost, but wandering. Mm -hmm. If Matthew and Luke are two versions of the same parable, then Luke's version seems to fit Jesus' situation better, which is why I focused on it today. Finding the lost is a joyful experience. The shepherd happily brings the sheep home on his shoulders. There is no grumbling about carrying the animal. The shepherd is rejoicing as he places that sheep on his shoulders. The joy of finding his lost one overshadows all else. In his overflowing happiness, he calls in others to share his joy. Have you ever been looking for something so hard and you couldn't find it? I was running late for work a few weeks ago, and I couldn't find my keys. And you can't go anywhere without your keys. And you can't go to work without your keys. And if you don't show up to work, you're going to get fired. Mm -hmm. But finally, I just took a moment and I stopped, and I prayed. I said, Lord, help me. I need you right now. And sure enough, not even two minutes later, I found my keys. Yeah. Verse 7, notice the words, more joy in heaven over one sinner. 
This does not indicate that sinful people are valued more than righteous people. Rather, the heavenly hosts are celebrating repentance, the return of one who was lost. When the lost becomes found, heaven throws a party. Again, Jesus' purpose is to help the religious leaders understand why he associates with the tax collectors and sinners in response to, in response to their complaint in verse 2. This parable is unique to Luke. Repentance is a strong emphasis for Luke. The verb occurs 14 times just in Luke and Acts, and the noun occurs 11 times. It is evident that for Luke, everyone had need of repentance, whether Jew or Greek. He mentions this in Acts 11 and Acts 17. If the 99 refer to the Pharisees and the scribes, then these words must be understood ironically as those who think they are righteous and have no need to repent. In the context of Luke 15, 1-3, the parable is in fact a call for the righteous to repent by sharing God's joy in the salvation of sinners. Most probably, we shouldn't press this detail into the parable, though, and seek meaning without respect to who the 99 really represent. Because they're not the focus of this parable. The basic reality to which this parable points is God's great joy over the repentance of the lost mm -hmm. as they receive life. The application in verse 7 brings out the joy in heaven over one repentant sinner. To quote an old Hebrew saying, there is joy before God when those who provoke him perish from the world. But Jesus teaches a very different concept of God. He rejoices over the return of the perishing more than the, the, those safely in the fold. There is joy over those two, but more joy over the repenting sinner. So the question becomes, how do we apply this parable to our lives today in 2021? How can Jesus' teachings and association with sinners have relevance for us now as Christians here today? My seminary and friend Kendra created a podcast called Advent Next. And up until a couple weeks ago on August 3rd, it was one of the biggest success stories in Adventist media. Since 2019, Kendra had hosted 89 episodes of the series, and she created it as life and faith discussions for the next generation. The show grew to thousands of listeners a month on audio and video platforms. And for Seventh-day Adventist millennial and Gen Z audiences, the show felt like a promising future, featuring diverse voices in real conversation. But then it all came crashing down a seeming victim of the church structure itself. For the summer of 2021, on the heels of Pride Month, Kendra recorded two episodes with former Adventist pastor Alicia Johnson. In 2017, Johnson had resigned as a pastor after coming out publicly as bisexual. This year, she finished securing funding for her book, Examining LGBTQ Theology for an Adventist Audience. Kendra was right that the prospect of backlash was very likely and it would come soon with a concerted, concerted inevitability. The episode aired Saturday, and by Monday she was messaged by the higher-ups and wanted to know whether the podcast episodes were contradicting SCA church policies in regards to sexuality and marriage. By Tuesday, she was called into a meeting with the Adventist Learning Community Director, Adam Fenner, and he informed her that her contract was being terminated. You see, at this point, her podcast had become so successful that ALC had picked up the funding and produced her podcast. This is what she had to say. He seemed reluctant to do it, she reflected afterwards. I think he really tried his best to find a way to save the show. But whatever was happening behind the scenes, it was bigger than him. I think I imagined them pull maybe pulling the episodes, taking those down, and getting talked to, but I didn't really imagine being fired. Because on policy, and on paper, you can't identify as gay or bisexual. The official 2015 NAD statement on human sexuality says that the church recognizes individuals may experience same-sex orientation through no choice of their own, and then it makes a distinction between sexual orientation and sexual behavior or activity. Kendra then used this opportunity to be honest. 
What I really have appreciated about Pastor Alicia Johnson is she began to open up the conversation for people like myself, Kendra said. I am belonging to the B of the LGBTQ community, and I really have encountered a lot of people in Adventism who identify as bisexual, or who also may just be in the closet, very deeply in the closet. And I just wanted to spend more time identifying with the community that I actually belong to, rather than hiding behind these spokespersons who have been on the podcast. Since I've already touched one hot button topic, I might as well go to another one. Let's think about this further with another scenario. Not related to the church. Last year, shortly after COVID happened, there was a documentary called Plandemic that featured Dr. Judy Mikovits, who had been a researcher and worked with Dr. Anthony Fauci very closely. She not only ousted the COVID-19 virus as created and released from a lab in Wuhan, China, but also that it was a money-making enterprise. And CNN has since announced that nine newly minted pharmaceutical billionaires have been just newly minted as a result of the COVID vaccine. Mm -hmm. And she also discussed how COVID could be treated effectively and affordably by hydroxychloroquine. This documentary went viral in a matter of hours, generated hundreds of thousands of shares and millions of views. And in a matter of 48 hours of its online debut, it was completely scrubbed from the internet, taken down from all streaming platforms and prompted with the the warning of misinformation that you now see labeled on anything that you put with the word COVID on it. Several weeks later, another video went viral, and it was titled America's Frontline Doctors, The Benefits of Hydroxychloroquine. In this press conference style video, a group of doctors spoke about the effectiveness of treating COVID with hydroxychloroquine, even that they've been treating patients effectively with hydroxychloroquine. This video was retweeted and shared across Twitter and YouTube, until it was ultimately removed from everywhere on the internet. Now my point of these two examples isn't about whether or not you agree or disagree with information in these videos. Rather, my point is that the fact that these videos were censored by the media moguls and the elites or big pharma, and my question is, is that the best method to remove the videos from the conversation altogether? Or does that not raise more flags for concern? more skepticism about why the conversation is being ignored. And is that partially why there's a significant group of individuals who are opposed to giving the COVID vaccine? In the same way, was censoring Kendra's episodes the best response? In silencing the question and the entire conversation altogether, does that make it seem more like we're the Pharisees? Silencing Jesus because he was associating with sinners and tax collectors? By silencing or removing anything related to these controversial questions, and issues that are prevalent to so many people today that are searching for answers, are we hindering the growth of the kingdom of heaven? Okay, so here's a question to think about. If Jesus was here today and was hanging out and eating with people from the LGBTQ community, would we be like the Pharisees and the scribes and be in an uproar that he wasn't hanging out with us righteous folk up at potluck? If Jesus was in the bars hanging out with alcoholics, would we question his authority as the Messiah? Mm -hmm. And if Jesus was with the bigots and racists who are flying the Confederate flag and protesting that Trump really won the election, rather than marching with us in the Black Lives Matter protests, would we question if he was truly the Son of Man? And if Jesus was hanging out with the anti-vaxxers, anti-maskers, and conspiracy theorists, and not social distancing during these COVID times, but rather giving hugs to those who are feeling isolated and proclaiming not to fear the Delta variant, would we question if he is truly the Alpha and the Omega? Right. Satan wants us to be divided. Mm -hmm. yeah. And look around. We aren't the United States of America. We are the divided states of America. Yeah. He wants to keep us divided so we can't all come together as one body of Christ. So why do we as Christians and Adventists have to be so exclusive to these groups of people. The way I see it, you are likely to be one of three characters in this parable. You might be in the 99, and good for you if you've never been lost before. That's great. You might be the one who is lost and needing saved. Or you might be the Pharisee who is missing the point of what God is asking us to do while on earth. Which one would you rather be? Consider this for a minute. Maybe 
you could be the shepherd. Maybe once you were the lost sheep, but the good shepherd picked you up at your weakest. He carried you back to safety and showed you love and mercy. And now he's calling you to do the same, to care for your brothers and sisters, to show them the same, the same love and mercy and grace that saved you. Has God asked us to say in, a, in an exclusive group of saved individuals that doesn't let anyone in from the outside, who doesn't look like us, act like us, talk like us, smell like us, think like us, or behave like us? Or has God asked us to be an inclusive group of, in, of once lost individuals who have now been found, who were blind, but now we see? who doesn't look at the sinner as one with a splinter in their eye, but rather takes the plank out of their own eye and says, Hey, brother. Hey, sister. I see you. Come on in and have a seat next to me. No, I don't care you've been drunk. No, I don't care what your sexual orientation is. No, I don't care you've been unfaithful to your spouse. No, I don't care you're a racist. No, I don't care you've done drugs. No, I don't care you aren't vaccinated. And when they ask you, why are you being so kind to me? Why do you not care about my past mistakes or my beliefs and opinions? You respond with Romans chapter 5, which says, Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare to even die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. It turns out, life isn't about choosing sides. But instead, it's about choosing Jesus. Amen. And also choosing to love others in the same way that he first loved us. Amen. He loved us when we were still sinners. Let me be the first to tell you, I was a lost sheep. Maybe you know me. Maybe you know my story. Maybe you don't. But let me tell you, I was lost and I was found. But here's the kicker. Even once you've been found, you can still get lost again. Amen. If you watch The Chosen, the new fresh series about the life of Christ, there was an amazing episode this season with Mary. In the first season, she was demon-possessed until she met Jesus. And after she met Jesus, she said, I was one way, and now I'm completely different. And the thing that happened in between was him. But then in the second season, she relapses. She's so ashamed. And once Peter finds her, she says in tears, He already fixed me once, and I broke again. But Peter convinces her to come back to him. And Jesus says to Mary, I forgive you. Amen. And that was it. It was over. A hug, an embrace, and it was forgiven. He will forgive you too. I applied to the SCA Theological Seminary at Andrews University, thinking I was at the bottom of the barrel. I was newly baptized into the church, lacking on Adventist theology, lacking on biblical knowledge, with a jaded past, and the enemy would attack me with thoughts like, how can I be a pastor? I've been a pothead. I've been an alcoholic, a rageaholic. I've been a sex addict. I've lied, I've cheated, I've stolen, I've been arrested before. I was selfish and self-centered, hungry for fame and fortune. I had my first two children out of wedlock. 
So I'm unworthy of being a pastor. But God, when God calls you, he makes the way for you. He doesn't see your past as a stumbling block, but a weapon that will shove it back down the enemy's throat. He will use those very struggles that you went through to, to reach others who are struggling. Struggling is a good thing. Struggling is defined as a strong opposing effort. If you're not struggling, then you're not wanting to change. If you're struggling with your sin, that means you want to change. I was struggling. I was struggling for years. And look at what God has done for me. Now I'm entering my last year at the seminary with a 3.9 GPA. I was just elected as the president of the seminary student body for this year. And I'm currently the media pastor right here at the Grace Place. I started at the bottom, but now I'm here. But God, but God, but God, God is not done with me yet. I can finally be free of my past and I can use it to help others. I see it now. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. What I thought disqualified me is the exact same thing that qualifies me. So finally, I want you to take a moment for self-reflection. Is your past holding you back? Have you found yourself wandering away again and maybe lost again? God is saying to you today, you will laugh again. You will trust again. You will love again. I am going to restore everything you have lost that has caused you to wander away. Think about this. If you're feeling down on yourself, if you're questioning everything that you've done wrong, think about this. Noah got drunk. Jacob lied. Moses murdered. David had an affair. Peter denied Jesus. The devil knows your name, but he calls you by your sin. God knows your sins, but he calls you by your name. Brenna, Jeanette, Erica, Hi Beth, Amelia, Brian, Georges, Tyler. Amen. God loves you too much to leave you broken. He will restore our hearts. And while it's true that Jesus came to save us from the consequences of our sin, the punishment we rightly deserve, he didn't erase our sentence. Instead, he took it upon himself so that our relationship with a just and loving God could be restored. That is the reckless love that is beautiful and perfect and worthy of being preached until our last breath. That is what drew me into the grace place. We are a place of misfits. We have been ostracized. We have made mistake after mistake. We have been down on our luck. We have been wandering around aimlessly. We have been outcasted for the way we look, the way we talk, the way we smell, the way we act, or the way our kids act. We've been kicked out and told so many times that we don't belong, but now we have found a place where grace abounds. And we are in this together. So rejoice with me if you're walking free. Rejoice with me, I am walking free. Say it with me. Rejoice with me, I am walking free. Rejoice with me, I am walking free.